promise. <laughs> Hello, I'm Tom, your friendly neighbor atheist, and this is one old white guy. A little about the show title. I have always had the, not always, but uh, when I was younger, I always had the impression that uh, atheists were just old white men. Uh, in high school, the only atheist I really knew about that was outspoken was Richard Dawkins, uh, who at the time I thought was a bit of an arrogant asshole, uh, which I've later come to understand through dealing with uh, Christians and other such religions, that Richard Dawkins is not an asshole, he's just aggravated. Uh, and I understand that completely now that I'm also an old white guy, but when I was younger, everyone I knew was Christian. Everyone I saw was pretty much Christian. Everyone I knew about was pretty much Christian. I knew about other religions, but they were so minor to me that it was hard for me to really get a grasp on the fact that Christianity wasn't like 90% of all people. Uh, once I got into college, again, most people were Christian. And most people that I knew were atheists were also white guys who were formerly Christian. Um, and of course, as I got older and, and had a better understanding of other religions and other cultures, I realized that there was probably a lot more atheists than just white men who were Christian, formerly Christian. Um, and still, when you look up atheists, you mostly see white men that used to be Christian. So anyhow, I wanted to talk to people who weren't previously Christian and most likely weren't white men like myself. And today I'm speaking to the masked Arab who is formerly Muslim. Yes? Yes, that's correct. So this is an opportunity for me to talk to somebody who is as well, not as far as from Christianity, but I guess on the flip side to a lot of people, uh, since Christianity is probably the well, first or second, and Muslim is probably the first or second also. Um Anyhow, so very unusual to be a atheist and formerly Muslim. Tell me, how did you come to, I guess, find yourself to be atheist? Uh, well, I, uh, I I did spend a good part of my life um, up until uh, my very early thirties, uh, and I was a completely convinced Muslim. I I had no reason to doubt whatsoever. Um, I mean, when I, when I was younger, I had several several things that maybe niggled away at my mind uh, when I kind of thought, well, is this actually... I never, I never thought, is this actually true as a religion? Maybe there were kind of several aspects within the faith itself that I kind of questioned, but then I was satisfied with the rest that it made sense, and I was convinced of these kind of claims that the Quran had some kinds of miracles in there. Um, for instance, it had numerical miracles and it had uh, scientific miracles and so on. Um, and so that kind of really convinced me for, for a very long time. And I had no real reason to doubt that. Um, up until, I would say, uh, maybe 20, late 2013, yeah, late 2013, I, I kind of felt bad that all my friends and family and some people I knew and primarily my brother uh, were very much kind of you know that they they understood religion and Islam a lot more than I did and I kind of I understood it very well but they understood it to another level where they were kind of you know very knowledgeable in terms of uh, basic kind of obscure small judicial you know uh, jurisprudence rulings on, on issues that are kind of useless to most people um, but I kind of thought, well, it's kind of shameful for me not knowing my religion properly, and I, I wanted to kind of explore it a bit more and understand it a bit more, with the only intention of making it stronger for myself. So I, I basically set out to increase my faith before I ended up as an atheist. Um, and, you know, long story short, I, uh, I, I basically saw a documentary um, that was about the, prophet, the, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, and I wanted to kind of understand the... Uh, you know his life and early Islam uh, a bit more and one of the things that came up in the documentary was the fact that slavery was never banned in Islam and that came as a huge shock to me because I was o I was always told as a child that it was you know one of the noble things that Islam did was get rid of slavery um, and we have this film in the Arab world uh, which we see quite often and I think many Muslims have seen this film it's called The Messenger 
or the message, sorry. Uh, in Arabic, it's called the Risala. And uh, this was a film, I think it was in the 70s, that was released. And it was, uh, you know, it's a film that every, pretty much, I would say, every single Muslim has watched and base, and base their knowledge of early Islamic history on. And now, looking back at it and having, you know, having studied quite intensely the, the Sira and the Hadith and, the, you know, the Quran and, and, and the story of early Islamic history, I look at that film and I think, wow, that is, you know, extremely cherry-picked. Uh, and not only that, some of the some of the things they they choose to put on screen are things which have very weak foundations in the actual Islamic sources themselves, and they completely ignore the things that have you know a stronger uh, you know a stronger stronger credibility, let's say. Um, so when I when I heard about this slavery is not right, you know that that it wasn't it was never banned, I, I kind of thought to myself, wow, hang on a second, are you really telling me that? you know, the God that created this entire universe, somebody who loves everybody, somebody who's absolutely just, would, in, you know, would allow slavery, would allow me to own another human being as property, but wouldn't allow me to eat a ham sandwich. And that was, you know, that was, that was, that was maybe, you know, the thing that, that got my mind ticking. And then I kept on watching this documentary, it was about three hours long, and towards the end they, they told us about the story of Banu, uh, Banu Qurayba, which kind of is pronounced Banu Qurayza, in English, it's a it's a Jewish tribe in Medina, uh, and there were basically three Jewish tribes at the time when Muhammad entered Medina after he was kind of kicked out of Mecca. Um, and initially, you know, they 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 all got on fine, but I think my personal, you know, the, the the way I see it and the way I've kind of looked at religion and kind of tried to try to kind of picture together and uh, and kind of understand what 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 was happening. Uh, the way I saw it was that he was getting frustrated. Um, he was trying to call out to monotheism, you know, to, to Jews uh, in particular, for, for them to join Islam. I think he he respected the fact that they were monotheists, um, and he, you know, obviously took on their god, uh, took on their stories. And you know, ask any Muslim today, you know, they'll tell you straight away as a as a you know as a matter of pride when they're discussing this with Christians and Jews that oh look Moses is, you know, is the prophet whose stories are most commonly found in the Quran. It's not Muhammad or anybody else, it's Moses. See, we love all the prophets, blah, blah, blah. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a good reason why it was Moses, because he was trying to he was trying to get the Jews to kind of join him in, in this religion, and I think after a while he got frustrated. So the story of Banu Qurayza is, firstly, there was two other Jewish tribes. He kicked them out of the uh, of Medina. The first one he wanted to kill, but was convinced uh, of not killing. Uh, he was kind of talked out of it. And then uh, the second one he just exiled, and the third one he basically uh, besieged for about 20, I think 25 days. Um, you know, no food, no water, and then when they surrendered, uh, it, basically they were prisoners of war. And uh, yeah, he allowed he allowed one of his friends, who he knew absolutely detested this tribe, to choose the judgment. And when the guy came, he said, "Well, I choose." that these Jews, uh, anybody who is above puberty, basically anybody who has pubic hair um, and above, so and older, uh, in terms of the males, will be beheaded and all women and children will be enslaved. And then Muhammad apparently said to him, you know, this is according to the Islamic Sira, that, oh, you know, fantastic, this is exactly what God would have uh, judged as well, so we're going to go with that. And they killed an estimated between 600 and 900 people that day, beheadings uh, in the trenches of the market in Medina. And I kind of thought to myself, well, wow, surely this is not true. Surely this is just made up. Surely this is, you know, this is these are lies distorting Islam. And you know, so I basically kind of, you know, I, could, I couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I thought to myself, well, if ISIS were to do that today, you know, I was one of those people when when I saw ISIS doing stuff, I would say, oh, nothing to do with Islam. This is this is something that they they're making up. When I heard about this, 600 people beheaded in one day. That's not that's not easy to take. And I kind of thought to myself, well, if I saw that happening on TV, and ISIS was doing it, and and they they come out and behead 600 people in one video, it would be absolutely outrageous, right? I mean, people would be people would be kind of going you know going out of their way to deny this has anything to do with Islam. But there there is a you know there is an exact. Uh, precedent to that happening from the time of Muhammad. So, 
you know, to deny this is nothing to do, to say this is nothing to do with Islam is, is obviously not reading the Islamic texts. And whether this happened or not is no longer that relevant. It's, it's the fact that if it did happen, then that's horrible. If it didn't happen, then there's a problem with the religion itself in that it doesn't really preserve uh, the life of Muhammad or the Hadith. You know, the Quran specifically tells Muslims to basically, you know, see Muhammad as an emulation for their life. You know, mm-hmm. to, to kind of to kind of follow his example. And if if we're asked to follow his example and uh, the Hadith and the Sirah are not preserved properly, then how do we know that we're follow, following the right example? I mean, the people who are doing this in ISIS today, you know. As far as God is concerned, he should, you know, he would also be unjust by punishing them, technically, you know, even though they're crazy nut jobs, but they think they're doing the right thing, <laughs> because because he didn't bother preserving, you know, the life of the prophet. So I think that was kind of the the beginning for me, and I kind of started looking up Islamic sources, trying to find refutations, and I couldn't find any refutation that was that was convincing to me, um, and so. Yeah, I slowly, slowly and gradually, I kind of, you know, came to the realization that, hang on a second, this is kind of all messed up, and everything that I had imagined before that was completely true, like I thought it was a fantastic scientific miracle, the Quran itself, and it had scientific information, and then I started looking at different verses, and then I was kind of shocked with what I saw, and as an Arab, I could kind of read straight to the text. I didn't have to bother with the translation, so a lot of the apologist arguments would try and you know, try and run out, you know, run away from the uh, original Arabic. Uh, yeah. And I kind of, you know, it didn't work with me because I could, I could read, read the original Arabic, I could read the uh, the tafsirs, which is the commentaries and the exegesis of, of the mm-hmm. Quran in Arabic as well. Uh, and it didn't make sense to me at all, um, the way that they tried to explain things away. Well, that's kind of a, a common joke among my circles is, if you want to make somebody an atheist, just have them read the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the stories yeah. are, are very similar, and that the horrific stories of of not only what you know God allowed, but what God basically told people to do. So it's the mm-hmm. same kind of uh, yeah, shocking stories that you find like that. That can't be a just God, and and really yeah. makes you question. Yeah, you know, what, what is this religion really about? And uh, you, you mentioned ISIS, and I make the comparison here with the KKK. Mm-hmm. Um, if the KKK was, you know, they, they considered themselves a Christian group. They considered yeah. themselves true Christians and, and the, you know, the God-chosen Christians. And yeah. if they were doing today what they were doing, you know, even 50 years ago, um, mm-hmm. people would be shocked. I mean, they, I'm sure they were shocked, you know, 50 years ago, but... Uh, not as shocked as they should have been, and if they were doing those things now, you know they'd be horrified, and yeah. that's really kind of what you know the uh, what ISIS is yeah. doing. Yeah, really horrific acts in, in the name of God. Yeah, but one thing to add, I mean, you know, I, I, what I find is a common, let's say, a misconception from from theists. They're, they'll, I mean, they they imagine that we kind of, you know, we personally, I, I can say on from my personal experience, I I didn't become an atheist because I read. The God Delusion or anything else. I actually haven't read any single atheist book so far, and I still haven't. And I've been an atheist for one and a half years and two or oh, two years now. Um, so I mean, I, I haven't read any of any of these athe- you know books by let's say the new atheists, uh, mm-hmm. not because I don't want to read them, but because I find it more much more interesting to kind of form my own, my own opinion um, on on these you know Islamic texts and you know even the Bible. I, so I that's number one. Number two, people also think that, you know, oh, well, you're looking at ISIS. They're not true Muslims. You should go to the sources. I'm sorry, but, you know, if I was looking at ISIS, you know, I, since 2003, we had their predecessors uh, begin, and they were called Tawhid and Jihad uh, in Iraq. And I, you know, I, you know, I was basically, I lived in Iraq for a very long time, and I still go there very frequently. Um, so I would have left Islam, if I was basing it on, the actions of Muslims, I would have left in 2003, uh, but I was not basing it on the actions of Muslims. I was ob- obviously, as as I should be, horrified with the, what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it was only when I started reading the Islamic texts themselves and realized that ISIS have every justification, you know, pretty much every justification to do what they do. 
Mm. Uh, and the early Islam was not very far away from their version of Islam, but it was very far away from, you know, my version at the time, which was kind of moderate Islam. Um, you know, the kind of, you know, the, the 21st century, uh, you know, in denial, head in the sand kind of Islam. <laughs> now, have, have uh, looking yeah. at any other religions influenced you at all to see uh, the comparisons? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I uh, when I when I was kind of researching, you know, when I, when I was initially shocked by what I found in the Islamic texts, I started looking at videos and certain videos here and there, and I started kind of looking at um, you know atheist videos and Christian videos. Um, and you know, I had like uh, I think the Christian videos, people like David Wood. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, it's Acts 17 apologetics. He's actually quite quite well informed on the Quran. And there's an Arabic mm -hmm. guy called uh, Rashid as well. He's quite he's quite good. He's an apostate from Islam who's gone to Christianity. Uh, and they you know they're they're quite well informed on on Islam and the Quran. But you know they use kind of common sense, reason, logic, etc when it comes to Islam, but the moment that you start talking about Christianity, that all goes flying out the window. And, um, you know, to me, it was kind of a natural second step when I realized that Islam was false, that, you know, I was like, okay, I still believe that there was a God, and it was a monotheistic God, and it was, the, you know, probably the Abrahamic God. And mm -hmm. the natural stepping stone for me was, okay, Muhammad made this up, so let me go back one. And, you know, going back one would be, you know, going to Christianity. And I think that's why a lot of ex-Muslims yeah, you know, I think most of them go to atheism or agnosticism, um, but some do. You know, if if they're going to switch religions, they tend to go to Christianity because it's the natural stepping stone backwards to them. You know, once you say that Muhammad faked it or you know he he made it all up, you go back to Christianity. But then I kind of I I looked at just Genesis one to be honest, um, read through it, and I thought, well, this is just as bad. <laughs> this is this is just as ridiculous. The the earth here appears before the stars. Um, you know, night and day before the sun, and I, I know that there are apologetic arguments for these. You know, there's arguments for every single, you know, rubbish thing in scripture or religion. Every single religion has its apologetics and has its excuses for why a certain thing is not actually a contradiction or it's not actually a scientific error. And the one thing I, you know, I would challenge any theist to do is to come up with a an independent objective criteria of how we can determine which religion is the right one, uh, when to determine when a religion is false. Because if you're going to accept all the apologist arguments for Islam, then why aren't you accepting the same apologist arguments for Christianity? You know, you're, you're obviously showing a bias. The, the Muslims are kind of thinking, oh, no, no, Muslim, Islam is correct because of these reasons. And then, oh, no, no, Christianity is, oh, no, the, the Christians are just making this up, and vice versa. And the Christians will say the same thing. They'll they'll say that their book is perfect and the Quran is is horribly, uh, you know, absurd. And I just can't understand why anybody would go from a Christianity to Islam after having discovered that Christianity is wrong, or vice versa, going to from Islam to Christianity. Um, so yeah, I mean, I and I I kind of I was you know I opened up my eyes to some atheist YouTubers, um, and I think the two that maybe so a couple of videos. That had a have had an, a bit of an impact on me was uh, 43 Ali. I don't know if you've heard of him. 43 Ali. He's a really good, really good YouTuber. He hasn't he hasn't kind of done videos for a while, but he did one on the historicity of Jesus. System. Yeah, he did one on the historicity of Jesus, which I found really interesting. Um, uh, and the fact that it, you know it could have been a legend, and look, you know, gathering together all the evidence and what was said in the epistles of Paul and what was later said in the Gospels. It kind of does show that there was, you know, there's a strong chance that a lot of this was just added in, uh, just to kind of make it more of a more of a story. And we see this as well in the Islamic sources, in the Quran, because it was there before the Hadith. You know, the Quran doesn't really speak about Muhammad performing lots of miracles. It doesn't doesn't actually speak of him performing any single miracle. Um, there's a vague reference to uh, the night of Isra. And Maharaj, when he, you know, obviously boarded the flying donkey or mule or whatever it was, and there's also a vague reference to the moon splitting, um, but other than that, it doesn't those two never actually put him in, uh, you know, specifically and directly in the Quran as the person who did these things. It doesn't even mention the winged horse. So the winged horse isn't actually mentioned in the Quran, but it's in all the established authentic hadiths. And I wouldn't say any. I would say not not a single Muslim probably. Well, I mean, obviously that's not true, but 
I would say less than 1% of Muslims don't believe that this happened. 99% do believe that, yes, he did board a, a winged horse. Um, but it's not physically in the Quran. Whereas in the Hadith, lots of these things start popping up. And, you know, in the Hadith, he spoke to a tree. Uh, and in the Hadith, he, he did all sorts of things, um, which were kind of a bit crazy and, like, miraculous. And I kind of see the same pattern happening with the Jesus evolution. Another video from Fulthriani was Noah and the fact that he kind of showed us that it was kind of a plagiarized story from, you know, Zia Sudra and, you know, and, and, and others before him, and Atra Hassis, I think it was, uh, and, you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh and, and, and all those kind of ancient tales. And it just, it just does seem like a massive coincidence that all the details are kind of very similar. Um, and I, I just don't buy the uh, theist argument that, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe they're all referring to the same story. Uh, you know, God sent millions of prophets or hundreds of thousands of prophets, and that's the, that's the Islamic argument for this. I just yeah. don't buy it. I think, well, how are we supposed to know when something's made up? It seems like it's made up. And then, you know, the other video that had an influence on me was uh, by some guy called Evidence, and he was talking about history of God, and he was, I think, referencing a, a book by Karen, Karen Armstrong about the history of uh, Yahweh and how he kind of eventually became the monotheistic God and by looking at the you know the original Hebrew of the Bible of the uh, Old Testament um, you would uh, you would start figuring out hang on a second this was a polytheistic religion that was later edited down to become a, a monotheistic religion and some of the hints of its early polytheism are still there and I, th I th that was a real eye-opener for me and it all started making sense and so that, those are the things that kind of influenced me. It made, made it very difficult for me to believe in this Abrahamic God. So it's, that's something, somebody I can definitely rule out with 100% certainty. You know, the question of whether there is a, whether there is a God that created the universe or not, you know, that's, that's another question altogether. And I'm happy to have that with people. And I wouldn't kind of think it's a silly question or a silly thing to debate necessarily. Um, I don't believe that there was. Um, but I would give that possibility a slightly more slightly more, more of a chance than a personal God who writes books, you know, the author God who uh, writes books and hires uh, personal official spokesmen on his behalf who, you know, otherwise known as prophets. It just seems yeah. slightly absurd to me. It's, it's always amazed me how people can go from, you know, change religions, go from mm. one major religion to another, and, you know, growing up thinking this is the one true religion, and then when they get older, like, oh, wait, no, that's the one true religion. And for some <laughs> yeah. like, okay, no, actually, this is the one true religion. You yeah. Know, there's, there's probably an equal number of, of Christians who have switched to Islam. Um, and some of them have become, you know, rather radicalized. Yeah. And I, I wonder what's going through these people's heads. And you can understand, kind of, if they see, you know, story in the Bible, and a similar story in the Quran, like, oh, that that just that proves it because here it's in two different books. And I look at it like, well, this is the one true book, and this is a different book, but it's got the same story. That you don't find that as a, a strange coincidence. Yeah. Um, for for me growing up, I uh, a good portion of my family is Jewish, um, and then we have like every variety and flavor of Christianity. And I so growing up, I went to you know Baptist church and Lutheran and Protestant and you, know, you name it, and uh, each church said, "You know, we're the one true one. This, you know, the other ones, they're you know, <laughs> kind of got it right, but this is the right one." So I, I never really was a true believer because I never really got sold on any one particular story. Yeah, I mean, I think when I was, uh, you know, first thing to say is I, I think what appeals to Christians going to Islam is um, what I think personally is that the issue is that the the idea and the concept of the Trinity is very confusing and I think even when you ask Christians who are well versed in their religion to try and explain it it will just seem daft when they try to explain it, it just seems nonsensical and I think that's something that Muslims jump on the opportunity of, of doing that, they, they'll go to a Christian and say look we love Jesus but we love him as a human being and as, you know, as a prophet we don't think that God actually had a son and I think that appeals to people, to some people who yeah. actually are thinking more logically than the Christians who are who are looking at it as a holy trinity? Um, you know, it, it does make slight, it makes a little more sense, doesn't it? I mean, that, that you know, for why for for some reason he, he he creates his own son and he kind of inseminates himself. Well, sorry, he inseminates um, Mary from his own self and then he's t 
to give birth to himself and then to sacrifice himself for himself. And it all gets very confusing if you kind of think about it that way. Uh, and I, I, you know, kind of a fundamentalist Christian, um, and he, you know, he's very strong on the uh, you know Jesus died for the sins. Who is and this? Sorry, um, who, who is it? this? My my cousin. All right. Um, okay. And he goes, and, you know, Jesus died for your sins. So I kind of retold the story of God using him as God and his son as Jesus, <laughs> and just continually saying, it's like, you know, your son, you did this, yes. and then your son, you did this, and then your son died and did the, you know, it's like you're the same person and yet you know you control everything and yet your son's doing this and he died but then he came back to life because it's you so he didn't really die he died to forgive your sins but you knew he wasn't going to die because he's you and just it's it is very confusing and, and it's baffling how people can justify it in their heads yeah one of the things that that, uh, that surprises me about christianity is uh, I, what I don't understand is um, is this whole kind of thing about oh well Jesus spoke to me and he speaks to me and I know him and I have a personal relationship with him and people you know they seem they seem fairly genuine when they're when they're making these claims and it is you know obviously um, it's to me it's one of the worst ways that God can show himself is oh unless you are totally gullible and full to the idea otherwise you're not going to see it and you know it, Obviously, a simple test of whether Jesus is actually talking to them or not, they could kind of ask him, maybe, you know, what year did you die? What year were you born? You know, and if, if they all, all these people get consistent answers, then they're talking to the right Jesus, right? I mean, otherwise, it's, you know, who are you talking to? So, you I, know, ask, ask him questions and see if, uh, you know, see if he comes up with, a, with the same answer. I, uh, actually, any Christian watching this, if you can comment in the sections below, you know, ask Jesus who I really am. I, I don't care if I'm outed by Jesus. That'd be great. I'll just join Christianity. So just ask him what my real name is and how old I am and stuff. And you know, if he gives you an answer, he should he should be able to know who the master Arab is. <laughs> so I mean, you know, I have several family members who who say just that that Jesus yeah. speaks to them and they have yeah. a personal relationship with Jesus. And and I point out, it's like, do you ever compare notes with you know some of our other relatives who who also speak to Jesus and uh, see if they've got the same story that you're getting? And basically, the excuse is always, "Well, Jesus doesn't work that way. He, he's he's very personal to me, but he can be very personal to somebody else differently." Like, yeah, so, so it's he, different versions of Jesus. Then it's not bipolar or psychotic. I mean, he's got multiple personality disorder. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's the best. You know, obviously, this is the best way that God can prove His existence, right? I mean, you know, and if we don't believe and buy into all this, then you know, we deserve fully deserve. To go into an eternity of hellfire. This is the this is the absurdity of, of, of the Abrahamic faith, in my opinion. That you know your you know faith is a virtue. You're you you're expected to believe something, and you know if if you start questioning and losing faith, it's a bad thing to lose faith. And uh, yeah, I have these d discussions with some of the, my uh, Muslim friends and family, and I say to them, well, you know, let's look at it logically. Let's look at it in terms of common sense. Let's look at the evidence here. And they'll come back and say, well, you know what, you've done the mistake of, of just looking at the evidence and this is a problem because you never really had uh, the same amount of faith that I have yeah. and this is an issue. And I said, well, well, maybe that's a bad thing. Maybe the faith that you have is shrouding your judgment. You know, you have, you know, your faith is basically causing you to have an emotional attachment to this religion which doesn't allow you to see it in an objective manner. If, if this is the punishment for not believing this religion, then how is it in any, in any way fair that it's so difficult to understand, that it requires so many extra explanations? It's just, to me, it just makes absolutely no sense. And, you know, if, if religion was completely harmless, like, um, you know, for instance, let's say, you know, obviously Jainism is, is one that's kind of touted out there as a, as a, as a fairly peaceful religion. Um, you know, Buddhism to an extent, you know, um, uh, and then, uh, yeah, if it was all like that, then I wouldn't really have much of an issue with it, except that it just seems weird and it will just kind of die off eventually. But when it's, you know, when it's zealots who control it, who threaten to kill you if you try, to, if you dare to think differently, um, then it, that, that obviously hinders progress. It hinders the progress of humanity and, you know, my, my particular region, the Middle East, it's, it's completely on fire because of religion. Um, yeah. and, you know whether people like it or not. I think that's a that's a well-established fact by now. 
and I, I get sometimes Americans commenting on my videos. Uh, I had one recently who was uh, kind of saying, you know, you're just overblowing all this, and you know, terrorism and all that. It's not really an issue, and gangs is more of an issue here. And I was like, well, what, what makes you think that I'm an American? What makes you think I live in America? What makes you think I care? You know, specifically that just about America and nobody else. I, you know, I care. I care about humanity. I care about the whole world. And I come from a region where this is absolutely the number one problem. So That's one yeah, thing why I want to do these videos is is basically to highlight a lot of things that a lot of Americans aren't exposed to that they don't see. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's just it's just very selfish, isn't it? I mean, when when an American kind of thinks. Oh well, you know, you know, Islamic fundamentalism isn't an issue here in my country, so why, why should I care? Well, you know, do you not care that Yazidi girls? I mean, I'm not a Yazidi, I'm an Arab, but that Yazidi girls are being raped this minute. I mean, small Yazidi children, uh, they're being raped because they're they're enslaved by by some disgusting, you know, psychotic men. Um, does that not bother you? Does that not make you, you know, kind of annoyed? Yeah, well, it makes me annoyed. Do you not really care about? <laughs> well, well, that's the thing. I know. I mean, the Bible is horrible, and, and and they've got so many things. But you know, they, I I love to always throw Numbers thirty one in people's face. You know, I had Jehovah's Witnesses come around to my to my door a, a while back, a few months ago. They've never come back since, surprisingly enough. Um, and yeah, I I kind of told them, well, you know, is uh, is it right or wrong to kill children? Is it always wrong to kill children? And they said, yes, of course it is. And I said, okay, well, just read Numbers 31 <laughs> and see what Moses did <laughs> to the children of the Midianites. He killed all of them, all the male children. Um, and so they, they were like, I think they were fairly shocked, but slightly in denial. So, you know, they tried to kind of try to excuse it. And this is the, the, pathetic, the pathetic thing I see in, uh, in Islam as well. When you tell them about all these beheadings that Muhammad did with Bene Kareva, they'll say, oh, well, these Bene Kareva, they were, you know, they were uh, traitors and look at the penalty for treason in so many countries today. It's like, well, okay. Every single male and pubescent child was a traitor. I mean, you know, surely not 600 people, all equally traitor treacherous. I mean, and, you know, they they were prisoners of war at the time. They, you know, this is according to Islamic sources. We don't even have the version of the story from Banu Karela because they're all dead. But, you know, from Islamic sources, it's still not very pretty, the story that we're told. And this is the one that was kind of whittled down and edited through. And we know that the seerah, the life of Muhammad, was actually edited down and softened up by Ibn Hisham, who took the original from Ibn Ishaq. Mm -hmm. And Ibn Ishaq's version no longer exists. So what we have is a watered-down version of it. And it's still very horrible. You know, the watered-down version is still very bad. I, I, I dread to think what the original version was and what, what actually happened. Um, yes, if we have both sides of the story. With the Bible, with the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the New Testament is the kinder, gentler version. Yeah. Um, the Old Testament God was the pretty, pretty harsh, so they, yeah. they rewrote it to make him look better, and he still looks horrible. So <laughs> he, <just laughs> he does. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, this is one of the issues with Christianity is that they, I think one of their down points is that they they believe in the Old Testament is true, and you know, it's so so easy just to discredit. Christianity completely because of the Old Testament yeah. and they obviously try to run away from this they can't ignore the fact that the Old Testament is true they can't say it was manipulated or changed like the Muslims claim that the Torah and Bible or, or Torah and Gospels were uh, without without any uh, justification sorry let me just shut that phone it's my landline I'll be second in one sec I'll be back. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you were going to ask me something. Uh, yes, you mentioned your family. How yes. have they reacted to your <laughs> loss of faith? Um, I think initially with some shock. So um, when I first told my wife, um, I was already kind of an atheist, and she didn't really know that I had questions brewing up in my mind that I was that I had been researching this for months. So she didn't realize this, and uh, when I told her, she dismissed it and she dismissed it as a face and she kind of thought oh it's just a face you know you'll be you know, you know you'll you'll come back I know it it's just this is just a face uh, and I said to her no it's definitely not a face and I can tell you why it's not a face I have good reason to believe this is not true and I I really can't see any way 
that these discrepancies or errors can be explained in a in a convincing way anymore. You know, it's just it seems to me like how can I if I was to accept the far fetched explanations that Islam gives me or the apologists give me, then why am I not expect why not why am I not accepting the far fetched explanations of other religions? I just don't don't see how I can choose one religion over the others, given they're all equally as as flawed in terms of their basic ideology. So that was my wife, and you know, eventually she came to kind of understand um, that it was me. You know, that I was not, that it was kind of you know a uh, a one way thing. Uh, it wasn't something that I would kind of potentially come back to Islam because of it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean that kind of upset her for a while. Um, you know, in Islam, technically the official ruling is I should be killed, as as you know, you know, an apostate. So I should be killed immediately uh, upon an announcing my apostasy. And uh, she should be forcibly divorced from me if I wasn't, you know, able to be killed. She should be forcibly divorced from me, and we have kids, so, you know, it's quite difficult for her. So sometimes she does mention that. She kind of says, "Look, you know, I, if we didn't have kids, maybe I would have left because I'm. This is this is haram. Haram means forbidden. So yeah. she feels guilty. She thinks that God is punishing her for kind of staying with me. Um, yeah. And I kind of I kind of feel bad for her, but I kind of want to explain it to her just to make her." Not fear this invisible man in the sky because there's no there's no sensible reason and justification to actually fear this person or this deity uh, that was very conveniently uh, fabricated and made up by ancient Jews. Um, aside from my wife, I would say my uh, my family. My brother was very devout and he still is, um, and he was fairly shocked. I mean, I kind of. You know, he always thought of me as like a good Muslim. You know, the, the you know somebody who's who's potentially a you know a good weapon in the in, in the arsenal of Muslims in terms of you know being able to speak logically and being able to kind of put convincing arguments forward, etc. Um, and so he kind of he kind of always kind of praised me in that sense. And I you know it was quite quite nice at the time. But then you know when I when I realized that it wasn't true any longer, I, I had to say something because. Islam is part of your everyday life. You can't avoid it. You know, Christianity maybe you can kind of just avoid going to church on Sunday, but Islam is, you know, you pray five times a day. Um, you fast during Ramadan. You, you know, even just basic, basic phrases that you say, like, uh, you know, Inshallah, God willing. You say it all the time. Um, and th there's always these things that come up that are kind of Islamic. It's just it's intrusive on 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 one's life to a very very high extent. And um, one of the things that uh, I didn't want to do is live in a state of hypocrisy. And I wanted to make sure that he knew that I wasn't actually a practicing Muslim. I didn't want to pretend to pray when he was, you know, when he came to, to visit me or I go to visit him. And I knew this was taking a risk. This could potentially mean that he cuts all ties from me. And I, you know, he's a, he's a very dear uh, person in my life. And, you know, I, I, I love the guy. He's absolutely great. And he's, he's funny. He's, he's great. He's, he's a smart guy. Um, you know, we we obviously you know grew up together, so you know it would have been it, it was a risk that I was willing to take because I I would rather not live in a state of hypocrisy. And initially, when I kind of sent him a few messages, um, it was just before I flew into Iraq, and I went I went to Iraq basically, and he was like, you know, Allah may Allah preserve you and you know protect you from all these kind of suicide bomb attacks, etc. Um, so I I kind of I kind of thought to myself, okay, hang on a second. This is this is not right. I can't, I can't keep pretending here that I'm somebody I'm not. And if yeah. he if he's genuinely my brother and likes me, you know, loves me for who I am, then he should accept this. Um, and so I kind of told him. I said, look, you, you, there are things that you don't know about me um, that basically are, you know, are, you know, I, I've changed my opinion on certain things and. You know, I would never disown you if you ever changed any fundamental beliefs that you had. And so I, I was kind of hinting up to it, and then I told him, look, I have huge doubts. I think it's it's all made up. Uh, and initially his reaction was, oh, no, that's perfectly fine. You know, a good Muslim is supposed to question his religion. You know, we're not supposed to be silly idiots who are only Muslim because we were born Muslim. We're supposed to question it, etc., etc." And then I kind of, you know, I kind of left it there. And he came back and like a couple of days later and said, I, I'm, I'm struggling to sleep. I can't sleep at all. I'm worried for you. I think you're going to go to hell and all this stuff. And obviously this is playing in his mind because he cares for me. So he doesn't want me to, to go to hell. 
And I said to him, look, I'm willing to debate you on this, and I'm willing to kind of come down, and you, if you can convince me, then perfect. But I'm willing to show you why. I'm, I'm not just lo leaving Islam for, because I don't like it or because it's inconvenient for me to pray five times a day. Well, no, that was never an issue for 30 years. Um, I'm, I'm leaving because it doesn't make sense anymore, and I think it's detrimental to society as a whole. So I think, in general, he's now more accepting of my apostasy, and I think he's, it's, it's kind of forced him a bit to, to reevaluate what Islam is about. You know, moderate Muslims today will try and reshape Islam just to keep that cognitive dissonance at bay. So, you know, he doesn't want to keep thinking that I'm going to go to hell. So what he'll say to himself is, yeah, I can't believe that my good-natured brother would go to hell. He knows I'm genuine when I when I say, look, this is these are the reasons I left. And I'm not kind of leaving because I want to leave. He knows I have actual good arguments that I'm raising. So he's kind of thinking, well, there's no way that the average ignorant Muslim in the Arab world who doesn't even bother trying to look into the Islamic sources, doesn't even bother trying to learn about his religion, just takes it from his father's, uh, listens to whatever the, the local mosque imam tells him, and then you know, takes it all on board and goes and does it. There's, there's no way that he would be rewarded, while my brother, who's more critical thinking, who's trying to, to, to kind of find the truth, would be punished by this God. So I think that's where roughly he is. I, I'm sure he's still frightened that I'll end up in hell anyway, because you know the God of the Abrahamic faith doesn't seem to be a, uh, you know, he's they keep saying he's the most merciful, but you know, reading about him and uh, you know in the Quran and other scriptures, you kind of find that yeah, actually no, he's not he's not that great. Um, so I think you know he he forces people to fear him um, as opposed to kind of respect him and love him for who he is. He's he's a he's like a mafia boss, you know. If you don't do what he says, he's he's going to make sure that you you're gonna you're going to be hurt. Um, and so my dad took it fairly well. He's not very religious. Um, you know, he's kind of what, one of the funny things about my dad was he kind of kept on saying to me, "Yeah, it's, it's just fine for you not to believe, um, just as long as you believe there's a God." And I said, "Well, that's kind of that's kind of putting a condition on on my own belief, isn't it?" <laughs> but he's okay. He's okay. He knows I'm a full atheist, and he's yeah. he's 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 okay with it. He's he'd rather he'd rather I think me be a full atheist than. Than a fundamentalist Muslim, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I have a uh, similar relationships. I've got a, a sister that sounds very much like the relationship you have with your brother, um, mm -hmm. and with my parents. My, I, I, I was always pretty much an atheist. I was never really a believer. Um, they just assumed I was a believer as a kid, and uh, when I was clearly an atheist, they they figured it out before I did. They figured it was a phase that I was going to grow out of. Um, my my mother did until she died, uh, mm. which was that long ago. But uh, she just assumed, you know, eventually you'll come around. Yeah. Uh, my sister is a devout Christian, and I I contrast her with my cousin, who's a fundamentalist Christian, uh, where he's like, "You're you're wrong. This this is exactly how it is, and you're wrong." My sister's devout Christian, where she she truly believes it. And she wants you to believe it, but you can believe something different if you want to, as long as you believe something. Um, but yes, yeah, she she's very worried for me. She prays for me all the time, and she's you know, she shows her concern, doesn't want me to end up in hell. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure she struggles with the same thing. Where it's like she knows I'm a good person, and and I I'm good to my wife, and I'm good to my family, and I'm hard worker, and yeah, I'm a, a good person. And she sees people who are Christians who are actually you know, they're, they're horrific people. And I'm sure it's hard for re her to reconcile, you know, these people believe, so they're going to heaven, and my brother doesn't believe, so he's going to hell, even though they're horrible and he's, you know, not horrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, they, they try to reconcile things, just like they, they're trying to reconcile the, uh, I think within Christianity, let's say the moderate elements, are trying to reconcile the fact of homosexuality, I think, now. Um, because they, they feel that you know society is moving in a way which they can't really reverse this trend anymore, yeah. uh, and, I, and I think they kind of they, they see the they see the logic behind it that well you know what's it to do with you they're, if they're kind of consenting adults you know um, it's not really any of your business and I think the new generation and especially is kind of seeing this where there's the old generation maybe still think it's an abomination I think more and more young people are kind of you know coming on board and saying well. 
hang on a second, what, on, what, on what basis am I judging and preventing other people from living together? I mean, to me, it's a, it's a case of, when I talk about this to Muslims, I say, well, what do you suggest? Do you suggest that we punish people? I mean, do you suggest that we, that we go around and tell them, hey, look, no, we knock on doors and say, hey, look, stop, stop sleeping together with that, you know, with that other man. Yeah. Or you know, or whatever. So it's you know, is it something that we can enforce by punishing? I mean, how can you kind of make this forbidden? <laughs> One of the funny things about homosexuality is that there's actually a hadith, uh, a saying of the Prophet, uh, where he basically I think says, um, every time a man sodomizes another man, the throne of Allah shakes. So basically, the throne of Allah shakes every time homosexuals have sex. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, if that is true, he must be on an endless vibrator kind of ride, <laughs> right? <I> mean, <laughs> you know, his 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 throne is not stopping at all, given that there's seven billion people in the world, um, and I'm sure you know at any given moment there are hundreds of gay people having sex. Um, so his throne is is completely it hasn't been stable for hundreds of years, maybe. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean that'd be funny if it was true. Uh, I, I doubt it's true, though. But. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that it's, it's difficult for people yeah. to their long-held beliefs that they've always been told you know, homosexuality is wrong. Yeah. And it, that's been reinforced, basically, by society and, and um, the church. And for that to change, I mean, that's my, my big argument against the Bible is the Bible is basically set in stone. You either believe it or you don't believe it. Yeah, you exactly. either take it all or you have to question it all. Yeah. And uh, for something to change in society that goes against the Bible, that really has to, you know, that's like a big marker saying, well, like, maybe your Bible's not right. And everyone, yeah. all these people are agreeing with the Bible not being right. And where does that leave you? So I, I can understand why that would be unsettling and it's hard to let go of yeah. those. Things. You know, it's like the issue of, uh, of objective morality. You know, do, do we see Christians today owning slaves? No, we don't. You know, is that is that because God tells them not to? He certainly doesn't. Um, yeah. You know, do we see people, you know, Christians today, you know, eating shellfish? Yes, we do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, you know, are they doing this because God allowed them to eat shellfish? Uh, no, he didn't. You know, and you know, you can very easily read into the fact that Jesus said that he wouldn't change the letter of the law. So, you know, everything should still apply to Christians today. You know, even the you know the ban on eating pork products. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, to me, the only way, you know, how earlier I mentioned, I, you know, if somebody can show me a very, an objective, an objective way of judging how a religion, a specific religion is correct, you know, they wouldn't say, hey, this religion is correct because of X, Y, Z. They would say, okay, this is the methodology that we're going to use, and this is what we're going to use, and we're going to, we're going to go to every single religion, and we're going to use this methodology. And if it passes, if there's one religion that passes all the tests and, and other religions don't, then that religion is the one true religion. If you can show me that, great. But if I, I, in my personal opinion, if a scripture is not meant to be read literally, it's absolutely worthless because all it does is open it up to interpretation, and you can interpret it a, a million ways. And Muslims pride themselves on the fact that oh yeah, the the Quran is preserved, and it's it's actually not preserved, and I'll. I'll hopefully be doing a video about that a bit later. Um, you know, it's probably like months away, but you know, it's it's not preserved, and there's plenty of evidence to show it's not preserved. Um, but anyway, they say they pride themselves on the fact that it's preserved, and you know, it's, it, it hasn't changed. Uh, but what's what's the point of that? If if anybody can come in with a with an exegesis, and you ask, you're told, look, you can't you can't understand the Quran on its own. You have to go to what the scholars say and what the experts think. Um, and then you go to the scholars and experts, and they all have varying opinions on different verses. Um, and then what? You, the other problem you have with the Quran is it's it has the concept of abrogation, which means that there's a lot of contradictions in there that are kind of you know worked away in the fact that they, they're explained away by the concept of abrogation, which means if if Muhammad told, for instance, um, Muslims to fight armies to to not desert the battlefield if the army was only up to 10 times larger than them and then he automatically changes his mind to okay yeah I see that's too much for you so basically God is now saying if the army is twice your size you have to stay on the battlefield or else you're allowed to kind of flee um, and that's a that's an abrogation in the Quran mm. so 
those types of abrogations would, would be very difficult to spot given the fact that nobody really knows exactly which verse came before which verse. Muslims have a general idea of which chapter came before which chapter, but the verses within chapters didn't all fall into place together. So chapters weren't revealed according to Islamic theology. They weren't all revealed in chunks, in, in as whole chapters. They were revealed in smaller chunks and then pieced together as part of different chapters. And the way they were pieced together seems quite random. It's like from the biggest surah to the smallest, roughly speaking. Um, so that's that's a problem because if you have the concept of abrogation, how are you supposed to know which particular verse to follow? Is it the one that tells me to kill all the infidels, or is it the one to tell, that tells me, you know, be nice to other people? Um, the way that the abrogation is set up, the way that we have our hadith, and the way it's ordered at the, at the present time, it tells us that the violent verses are the ones that came at the end. So they abrogated all the peaceful ones, and now all the moderate Muslims will tend to say, "Hey, look, but look at this verse." It says if whoever kills a person, a human being, uh, innocent human being, then he's, it's as if he's killed the entire of humanity, you know, the entirety of humanity. And while that's true, it's in there, but that's specifically attributed to the Israelites. That's God speaking to the Israelites. He's telling the Israelites, if you kill an innocent person, um, then it's like you killed humanity. Just as he told the Israelites to observe the Sabbath, a Muslim can ignore this passage by saying, well, this is not specific to all humans, this is specific to the Israelites. And it appears twice in the Quran, twice to the Israelites. Whenever a, a moderate Muslim quotes it, he will he will take out the first part, which which makes it clear that it's referring to the Israelites. Uh, and anyway, you know, when it says innocent human, that just leaves you with a you know who's an innocent human. So it kind of leaves it open ended and you know open to interpretation of who an innocent human being is. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you know, you can, anybody can interpret it that way. So to me, Islam fails on that on that uh, particular point that you know it's it's not meant to be let, read literally or well, if it's not meant to be read literally then it's open to millions of interpretations and you can't really tell me it's preserved and it's clear the Quran yeah. itself talks about itself being clear it's just too many too many question marks and I what what fascinates me now Tom is that the um, is the psychology behind religion I I, I really try, I want to get behind that because it's for me, and maybe for you, it was kind of easy. And for a lot of the atheists today, um, it was easy to kind of see how flawed this religion is, and and how how it was obviously man-made. And you know, we can see when people are using their bias to kind of ignore reality and and just you know make their religion true in their mind. And that you know that's a huge thing. And it's, you know, you can't really blame people. It's obviously a a result of evolution. You know that you know we haven't evolved enough yet. <laughs> we we haven't evolved enough to be to be to to figure to figure out how to how to spot our own biases. Um, so it, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, yeah. Now now that evolution, I mean, there's there's people who are are begrudgingly accepting evolution, and now they're using evolution as uh, another confirmation that the Bible is true. Is yeah, that yeah. we evolved to believe that there was God because there's a God. <laughs> well, the thing is, I'm I'm sure that you know Muslims today, like 99% of them, deny evolution. Um, West, you know, Muslims are still way behind Christians on this. Uh, Christians, maybe I I would say maybe 50-50 or something. You know, it, it, it's probably fairer uh, as as an estimate. 60-40. 60-40 uh, Christians are not buying it. They're not buying evolution. Okay, so they're still. There's still some way to go before we get to the uh, majority, um, but still, you know, 40 is a hell of a lot better than, you know, five percent or ten percent or one percent. I don't know what it is in Islam, but I would, I would very much doubt it's above ten percent who believe evolution is is actually true, um, who or let's rephrase that, who understand that evolution is true. Um, yes. It doesn't re it doesn't require a blind belief. You just have to look at the evidence. Um, so, but I, I am I am sure that. Uh, one day they will try to skew the Quran as they always do, to show that oh look it told us evolution about evolution all along. Who could have known that 1,400 years ago? And they can. There's a verse. There's a verse in there that says um, that every living thing came from water. So yeah. you know obviously Thales kind of hypothesized this a thousand years before Muhammad. But you know a Muslim will tell you oh this is a miracle, and I think they can kind of make an argument if they wanted to. 
um, that look, you know, evolution tells us that we began as like these microorganisms in the, the oceans. And, you know, every living thing came from water. That tells us that right there. Yeah. But you can't ignore, you can't say that and then ignore the fact that in several other places it says Adam and Eve were created, um, you know, and from from mud or whatever it was, you know, clay, because it's they're always created from different elements and yeah. and, and mixtures. Very dust. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of a bit of a, a strange one, isn't it? I mean, what were the uh, ancient elements? It was uh, was it fire, water, uh, yeah. earth, and uh, air. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so. The the jinn who are like the you know the devils are mostly jinn. Uh, they're made from fire, according to Islam. Uh, we're made we're made from earth, um, and then you know the angels are made from light, which isn't really one of the four elements. But you kind of can see that it was very basic when when they thought of the elements, and it kind yeah. of had a, had a bit of an influence into oh yeah, we're the ones made from earth. They're made from fire, and these guys are made from light. Because light is holy, and it's like angels, wow, you know, with the wings flying around. Um, I often say, if you read the Bible as it's written, it shows a, a fundamental lack of understanding about the world around them. It's only when you read into it, it's like, oh, well, this is what they actually meant. And it's always yeah. what they actually meant, but uh, that's not what it says. Well, exactly, absolutely. And that's the thing in this time as well. But in the Bible, I mean, for instance, the uh, was it, who is it, Joshua or... I think it was Joshua or somebody else who was battling people uh, and he needed extra hours of sunlight uh, during his battles. And then, you know, I think the Bible says specifically that God made the sun stop for yeah. a whole 24 hours. Okay. So, you know, he could, it could have said that he stopped, God made the earth stop rotating and, like, given us some, you know, decent information showing that he was actually, you know, somebody who knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then... It's it's same thing with the Quran. Uh, when Abraham challenges, I think one of his, uh, you know, one of the infidels of his time, the evil king or whoever it was, um, who was claiming to be, you know, similar to a deity, and he would say, "Well, my God brings the sun out from the from the east, so why don't you bring out from the west if you're also a god?" Yeah. You know, obviously the other guy could have said, "Well, no, actually, I'm the one bringing it out from the east. Why doesn't your God bring it out from the west?" You know, that that would have been the easier reply. Um, but the Quran tells us the story differently. It tells us that the other guy was kind of, you know, stumped. He didn't know what to respond because he was kind of, you know, he was he was uh, proven wrong. <laughs> yeah. uh, and and you know, he could have said something that was kind of slightly different. And obviously, we have the the verse in the Quran which tells us that the sun sets in a muddy spring. And a lot of people deny that, and I'll be doing a video on this quite soon. It's actually, when you look at all the evidence, it's very clear that it was meant literally and not meant figuratively. And what kind of, you know, what kind of metaphor would this be? And they're saying, no, it was only from the vision of the person seeing it who would have seen it behind the horizon setting. And they'll, send you, they'll start sending you pictures from Google Images of the sun setting in the horizon behind the sea. But it says it's a muddy spring, a, yeah. a, black, a blackened muddy spring. Find me a blackened, muddy spring of water somewhere on Earth that extends all the way to the horizon. You know, they'll claim, oh, it's the Black Sea. It's not the Black Sea. You know, it's a spring, not a sea. Yeah. There, there are two different yeah. words in Arabic for spring and sea, and they're both used in the Quran, Bahar and Ain. Um, and the biggest spring in the, on, on the, in the world, as far as I, as far as I can uh, tell and, uh, through my own research, is about, I think, 200 meters in diameter. And that's, there's no way that would appear beyond the horizon. So it's clearly a false a false book, but you know, people trying to kind of explain it away with these ridiculous explanations, it's it's comical to see sometimes, but it's also very, very sad. You know, it's very sad that humans will just not let go of the fear they have. And I think it's primarily that it's primarily down to the fear that they have that if they start questioning these things, if they start daring to say that the Quran is not the word of God, you know, if they start using their brains a bit more they're going to get punished. Well, they've been told their entire lives, if you don't believe this, you're going to hell. Yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah. that's a hard thing to let go of, I imagine. It is, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult thing to kind of... It's a difficult fear to get out uh, of your system. And I, I have a lot, a lot of ex-Muslims or Muslims who are skeptical, who watch my videos, who then 
uh, come to my Facebook page or send me a personal message on YouTube. And a lot of them are kind of, you know, saying the same thing. And, and they're saying, how did you get rid of the fear of hell? I can tell that Islam is not the right religion. It doesn't make any sense anymore. But I can't shrug off that fear of hell. And I'm, you know, I'm terrified. What if I'm wrong? And surely I'm not, I'm not the only one that's right here. And all these millions of people around me are wrong. And they yeah. kind of, you know, they, they think that way. And I kind of think, well, I'm sorry, but, you know, A, if you were wrong and your God is a just, decent God, he wouldn't be punishing you for using the brain that he gave you. He gave you this brain that thought in this particular manner. So why would he punish you for a grain, for for using a brain he created in this in this particular way? He created your brain to allow for more reason than and, and for more skepticism than your average, you know, other Muslim. So why why would you think that he punishes you in hell for eternity? That wouldn't make sense. Um, so that's the first thing I would say to them. Second thing I would say, well, let's just look at the history of hellfire and punishments and things like that. And you know, if you go, I think if you go to look at the, look at Egyptian uh, mythology, I always take them back to that because it's very very similar to what we see in the Quran and the New Testament of the idea of hellfire. Um, you know, there are scales being used to uh, to determine whether somebody's been a good or bad person, and uh, there idea of hell is a lake of fire and their idea of heaven is uh, is basically a place where rivers flow and you know trees are there and you have honey and other stuff it's it's pretty much exactly the same description we see in the Quran I mean you know when the Quran describes heaven it doesn't tell you about like you know roller coasters and fun rides obviously it's you know it was it was written in an age where Maybe things would be more fun, you know. If I was to create my own mansion today, I would create a swimming pool and a go karting track and things like that, you know. But for them, it was like the promise of house and a house in heaven is rivers of honey and rivers of wine, you know, um, not rivers of like you know Pepsi or you know whatever people tend to like today. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you know. what a joke is, uh, you know, when, when uh, I guess most of them say. You had 72 versions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the joke is kind of like, you know, why would you want 72 versions? Why would you want 72 people you have to train? W wouldn't you rather have like, you know, two good whores, you know, two that know what they're doing? Well, <laughs> absolutely. Like uh, absolutely. The, the other thing is, you know, what gives you the guarantee that these 72 versions are actually female? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's could another be, joke. Could be 72 virgin blokes. I mean, that, that, I think um, family, family Guy did that joke. Because yeah. uh, they had a suicide bomber go to, to heaven. And he, There's he was a joke for uh, Bin Laden that dies and goes to yeah. heaven. He finds George Washington, who smacks him. And then Thomas Jefferson, who smacks him. And, he, and this list of people. And he goes, I thought I was going to have 72 virgins. Like, virgins? No, it's Virginians. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the thing is with the 72 virgins, as you say, I mean, I, I kind of thought to myself as well. When I, this was way before when I was actually a Muslim. Uh, and people would say, oh, you know, you get virgins in heaven and all that stuff. I kind of thought to myself, I thought, well, why would I want virgins in heaven? Why would I want, you know, why would I want that kind of slightly messy first time of having sex every time, you know, where, with all the blood and, you know, it's kind of like, well, can I not have it when it's, you know, like you said, somebody who's A, an expert, and B, without, without all this extra mess, yeah. Uh, you know, what's 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 appealing about about having sex with a virgin? I I don't, I don't understand that. Um, but yeah, just to clarify, um, as far as I can tell, that isn't actually um, is not an, an authentic hadith, uh, one hundred percent. So it's actually one of the misconceptions um, uh, that that non-Muslims have about Muslims, and I think Muslims themselves don't know that it's not one hundred percent genuine according to their theology. Um, it's fairly good. It's in a hadith which rated Hassan, which is basically the second, second highest uh, rating you can give. Um, but there's only kind of two ratings which are credible. It's the it's the like 100% sound hadith, which is Sahih, and the second one is Hassan, which means good. It's a good hadith. So it's a good hadith. It's not. It's not. You know, they can dismiss it if they want to. Um, is what I'm getting at. Just yeah. to clarify, because I I always like to kind of clarify. Um, and, and be accurate. I, I hate, I hate being inaccurate on on, on matters. <laughs> well, 
that's one thing I like about your channel is you're you're very yeah. informative and you try to be yeah. very accurate and, and uh, educational, which is which is really good. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a couple other YouTubers that that kind of uh, informed you and I guess inspired you. Um, who else has really kind of made you think about things and uh, and inspired you to you know have your own channel and do what you're doing? Um. I mean, I, I can say the the YouTube channels that I um, you know initially started watching and I enjoyed watching um, that that kind of inspired me to do to do my own. Um, I mean, non stamp collector, I I love that guy. He's he's amazing. The way you know his animation is kind of funny, but it's uh, it's just the way that he does his stories and and, and the logic behind it. He, yeah. You know, the, the the Bible one, the Bible contradictions quiz show is something that's great, and I I want to replicate that with the Quran. Um, maybe potentially doing something very similar, but like with the Quran instead of the Bible. Yeah. Uh, that that would be good, and that's, that's something I'll probably do in the future with I, I like with the help of somebody. Anybody could yeah. do it. Yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, his ideas are great. And uh, I uh, I uh, used to when I first started out, I, I watched um, a few atheist YouTubers like Cult of Dusty. I liked his uh, review of the Bible. Uh, is it the Bible? There was this program on TV. Um, it was like a show on TV which kind of told us about the Bible. I think it was called The Bible. I'm not 100% yeah, sure now. There's been a lot of them. So. Yeah, he does, he does this preview where he kind of just reviews it himself. Sorry, he kind of reviews it, uh, and we kind of see the story going really quickly. Uh, yeah. And that was, that was quite funny to watch. And at the time, I was actually still a Muslim who was kind of on the verge of leaving, so I was kind of... Finding it slightly blasphemous because he was, you know, he was saying stuff like, you know, oh, you know, you know, God would do this, of course he would, because he's a bit of a dick, and you know, and I would kind of feel like, oh shit, you know, if 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 God is actually out there, you know, am I doing something wrong here by watching this? But it was so funny that I just kept on watching, um, and like uh, Dark Matter two five two five, I I watched his videos a lot, and I I watched um, Atheism is Unstoppable, um, the, the 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 atheist kangaroo. Um, I like his yeah. content. You know, I really like his content, um, and I still watch him to this day. He's, he's, he's what, what I like about him is that he's um, he's he's really good at uploading a lot, which is which is my Achilles heel. I, I don't tend to yeah. upload a lot because I'm you know I I'm always distracted very easily with like comments on my present videos, and I you know when somebody's strawmanning you, you have to go in and kind of correct them. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, I, you know. I used to watch a lot of videos, and since I started posting my own, I watch very few because I spend so much time just responding to people. Yeah, see, this is the thing. I, I, I still watch a lot of videos, and that's that's the you know that's the thing. I, I should, I should um, you know watch less videos and respond less to people, so I have more time to actually do my own videos. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've you know I. Uh, I, the, the thing is, I, I do have a lot, a lot, a lot of work. So, you know, that's outside my kind of YouTube activism, let's say, um, and that kind of really keeps me busy. Um, and I would love, I, I would love to kind of do this, you know, full time one day. It's something that I passionately believe in, and I think, I think I can slowly make a bit of a difference. I, I I've already, I, I know of like thirty odd people who have already spoken to me. Um, who have already told me that I've influenced them yeah. on one on one degree or another to leave Islam. So I've I've ha I've helped people de deconvert, and I know a lot of people, a lot of atheists say, "Hey, look, that's not my mission." Um, but yeah, I'm not going to shy away from that. That is that is my mission. Um, I just think it makes the world a better place, a better place when we have less religion in the world. And I, but the thing is, I don't want people to do it just because. Um, I say so. You know, who, who am I to take on? You know, to take as a trustworthy source. That's why I always, every single time I, I make a video, I always put my sources in the description box for those who want to go and see it. I still, I still get so many comments from Muslims who say, "Hey, you're a liar. Hey, everything you said was was rubbish. Hey, that was all lies." And I always just point them back to the to the sources. I'm like, "Well, go go and check the sources. You know, I'm, if you're calling me a liar, fine. I'm." I'm saying I'm saying this because of these particular sources. So go and read the sources yourself. If you still think that I misconstrued, then fine. But at least I'm giving you the source where I get this information from, as opposed to just making claims without kind of you know unfounded. 
uh, without showing how I've kind of come to that conclusion. So I, I think that's, to me, that would be effective if I was a Muslim skeptic who was kind of thinking, ooh, is this right or wrong? I would, you know, so I've, I've kind of designed my channel in a way that I think is effective to people like myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, other people, for instance, might use different styles, and I think, you know, everybody has a style, and, you know, different people will be influenced by different things. And, you know, so some people might be different, influenced by mockery, for instance. You know, I mean, I, I initially thought, well, if you're going to mock people's religion, they're going to shy away and not watch your videos because they'll be defensive. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's true to a certain extent, but I think other people, you know, there, there are people out there who will be embarrassed if people are mocking them for any reason. And I yeah. think once that embarrassment kicks in, that they think, yeah, actually, why am I believing in this? This is actually slightly absurd. I think that kicks into them as you know, kicks in with them as well. I try to, I try to generally avoid that. But I, I am of the opinion that it that it is actually quite important to have this kind of you know good cop bad cop balance um, in the atheist community when we're kind of trying to spread reason and logic. Um, I think you know, you do a very good job of informing people and and showing the contradictions and and showing you know helping people to question what they believe. I think you're excellent at that. Yeah, um, and I, I hope that's the case because it's. Uh, I think it's quite important just to kind of show. And I, and I, when when I was going through, the thing is that the thing that kind of convinced me to start my own channel is looking at YouTube. I was watching so many videos. Uh, pretty much everybody is an ex-Christian atheist who, who speaks about atheism, but coming from a Christian background, they'll be criticizing the Bible, yes. uh, and their main issues are going to be with the Bible. And a Muslim watching these videos wouldn't have an issue with this because they'll say, "Oh well, the Bible is corrupt. Why don't you go to Islam? Why don't you start reading the Quran?" You know, I yeah. invite you to read the Quran. It's it's perfect. Whereas the Bible is obviously ridiculous, as you're showing. I agree with you, even though technically, and I, I you know, it's these, this is one of one of my other videos that I that I have on my to-do list, which is kind of stretching into maybe 2035 at this rate. Um, yeah. <laughs> basically, one of my videos is is showing that the Quran and early Islam and Muhammad himself never believed that the uh, the ancient scriptures, the Torah and the Gospels were changed. They the, the evidence from within the Quran itself shows that the uh, you know that they actually believe the Bible to be true. Um, so yeah, I mean it's uh, it's one of those videos that I'll do later. But it's it's a, it's a common misconception of Islam from Muslims themselves. They'll they'll assume uh, just because they say different things that the Quran or Islam or Muhammad said that they were they weren't preserved. There's nothing in the Quran that suggests that. Yeah, you know, that's quite interesting, I think. Now, um, would you? I mean, would you like to see more ex-Muslims doing videos? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I would. Um, I uh, I know of a few who do some really good videos. Um, uh, what, the what advice would you give somebody who who's thinking about it? I would say go ahead and do it. I would say, well, before you go ahead and do it, I would say just make sure that if you're going to enter into this kind of arena, just make sure that you've, you know, spend a few months studying this. You know, spend a few months maybe debating people online. Spend a few months uh, watching more videos. Spend a few months reading the actual sources themselves. Um, because, you know, you don't want to kind of set out a channel where you're constantly getting corrected because you're going to lose credibility. Yeah. Um, you know, it's good if you get corrected and then you, you know, publicly say, look, you know, I was mistaken on this particular verse. It doesn't actually say this or it doesn't say that. Um, but yeah, I would say just, just, you know, just get down and do it. You know, I, I think the more, the more ex-Muslim voices we have uh, on YouTube, the better. Because if you're out there as a Muslim skeptic, as somebody who believes in Islam but is quite skeptical of some claims, and you just see my video, for instance, you'll say, "Well, a he's masked, and you know who knows if he was a really, really a Muslim or not. You know, we don't know. You know, maybe he hasn't seen my Arabic videos, and they'll just assume that I'm some English guy uh, pretending to be an Arab. Um, and then you know he might kind of dismiss me and think, well, that's just one person. Uh, but if you start seeing more and more people out there, he'll he'll start." realizing that this is actually you know a bit of a growing movement that this 
you know, this is the way to go, this is the future, <laughs> you know, welcome on board, you know, join us, we're the pioneers here, we're the ones that, you know, we're the, we're the ones spearheading this revolution. Um, so it's quite quite a cool feeling if you kind of think about it in that in that aspect. Um, and, and we are, I mean, it's, there's, there's very few, you know, atheist uh, ex-Muslims around. It's, yeah. You know, um, well-known ex-Muslim ex -Muslim atheists, you can probably count like 10, 15 of them, um, if that. And that's, you know, well-known from people like me who um, who watch videos all the time about this stuff. Um, but for some random Muslim to know like an ex-Muslim atheist, they might even, they might know Ayan Hirsi Ali and that's it. Um, you know, or Salman Rushdie if they realized that he was actually a Muslim before. I yeah. think he, I think he was. Um, yeah, so those are probably the, the only two that they'll remember. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think overall it's uh, it, it's it's quite interesting. They, they they should do more videos, and everybody has a different perspective. So I will kind of have a different style. I will have different things that convince me personally, which I will try to emulate to convince more more people of why this is wrong. And there are other issues, let's say more philosophical ones, that have affected other people. So I've had people that have come to my channel. Um, and sent me private messages that have said the arguments for them, for instance, is well, if God is uh, if God is fair and just, then why would He punish us for eternity for finite crimes? So let's say finite sins. We only live seventy years, or eighty, or a hundred. Mm -hmm. Then why are we be punished forever? You know, it, the, the the punishment has to kind of has to be equal to the crime in a sense, right? Yeah. It has to be proportional. Um, and so, to some people, that philosophical approach works better than my approach. My approach is basically um, critique of the religion itself, of its sources, um, of saying, you know, I, I try to kind of stay away from the general philosophy of it and just try to debunk Islam as, as a religion, uh, using its own sources to do that. Um, well, so, that's yeah. important to get more people to do videos to one, give different perspectives, but also different styles of, of the message they're trying to communicate. You're very informative and you, you, you know, like to you critique, um, mm. that's with a lot of uh, Christians. I have a different form because you know, I've never really been a believer. I've always been an atheist. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my thing is kind of like, I get a question in my head and I, I say, you know, why do you believe this? You know, this is, this is kind of silly. Why do you believe this? And that's mm. kind of my thing. So it's it's good to have lots of different voices. And I mean, I would like to see. It. I would like to know more about Islam, and I I really would like to know about it from people who have basically given it up, yeah. who have uh, yeah really looked at it and have seen that you know yeah yeah really yeah to be. yeah. I think I think that's a good. Th I mean, I I kind of. Uh, yeah, when I when I one of the reasons why I started the channel is I thought to myself, well, hang on a second, this is, you know, when I said I've seen ex-Muslim YouTubers, yeah, I have, but it's not not very many. But the ones I like are not actually ex-Muslims themselves. The ones who critique Islam. Um, so, for instance, the Rationalizer, he's a fantastic YouTuber. I mean, look him up. He's he's really good. He's really smart, and he uh, he knows Islam really well. Um, there's another guy who's called Irish Infidel, and I love his. Videos. I mean, he doesn't really do them very often nowadays. But his videos from like two or three years back, one year back, um, they're very good as well. He basically, you know, he he opens your eye up to some verses. Even for me, watching it as a as an ex-Muslim who, who you know, who has a good knowledge of Islam, um, sometimes I'm look at, I'm looking at those videos and I think, oh, actually, that makes a lot of sense. And oh, I didn't realize this verse existed. Um, so he's he's quite good to look at as well to, to watch his videos. Stop spamming is another one, who's an ex-Muslim who does who does good videos. I'm sure there are I'm sure there are others as well. That's my. Well, I'm uh, going to have you uh, uh, if I can get you to give me a list of of these uh, channels and I'll list yeah. them in the description. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I I would you know I would love to basically encourage more people to kind of support those criticizing Islam uh, on YouTube just because I think a Christianity has a lot of you know there's a lot of atheist youtubers out there who critique you know who criticize Christianity and I can understand and I can understand why an ex-christian 
it might be more appealing to them to go to those kind of page uh, websites because they lived this particular religion. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, for them, it's it's fine. You know, it's it's something they can relate to. Whereas Islam is completely a new concept to them. But I would, you know, I, I would like to see more encouragement to you know voices who are criticizing Islam um, and basically, uh, you know, educating all of us to debate Muslims online because they do yeah. appear everywhere and you know. And it might seem futile at first, and in many cases, I'm sure it's futile if you if you continue debating them for a thousand years. Yeah. But with some cases, I think you might be planting a seed. You know, you might be able to get them to see it. You know, the way you see it. Um, and I think it's useful. And I think eventually, the more Muslims you have that leave the religion, um, the quicker you can get a re reformation in Islam or in the Muslim world, let's say. And I, I don't really believe that a reform, a reformation is possible in Islam. People say, I mean, for instance, Ayan Hirsi Ali says one thing that I, that I don't agree with, which is they need to reform the Quran and change it. And I, while that's a noble idea in a sense that they, they change the Quran, it's on a practical level that's never going to work. You know, they're always going to know what the original Quran was like. You know, we have the internet, people have hard drive copies, are you going to destroy all the present copies? Yeah. And what? And when you say to a Muslim, even a very a very liberal and moderate one, if you say to them, hey look, let's change the Quran, they're never going to come and say, okay, fine, let's take out this page, take out that page, let's add this page that we will write ourselves, you know, let's add this page or that page or whatever it is. Um, you know, they, they can't really say that because they know if they believe it's from God, then how are you going to change it to them in front of their very eyes? They, then it's, it's worthless. They're always going to go back to the original. And I think to me, to, you know, in my eyes, I think the only way we can reform this religion or reform the region, let's say, is, is by abandoning this religion altogether. Or the only other way where you can kind of keep Islam in a sense is to get Muslims to recognize that the Quran is not perfectly preserved. That it, you know, to get them to kind of start thinking, okay, well, a lot of things were potentially added in or taken out, and you know, if you get them to accept that, then you have a bit more hope that they can maybe start using their own common sense and logic and reason to say, okay, well, you know, if this prophet was a prophet of mercy and this God was all merciful, then surely he doesn't want us to chop off the hands of thieves or chop off the fingertips of unbelievers and chop off their heads, etc. Uh, or stone, you know, stoning isn't isn't really in the Quran. Stoning women to death or men for adultery, but okay. lashing, public lashing is public lashing. You give them a, a hundred lashes in public. That's yeah. clearly that's clearly stated in the Quran. But the, the the stoning part is is in the Old Testament and it's in the Hadith. Um, and you know, a lot of these barbaric rules have uh, have taken their place from from the Torah, as far as I can see. Um, I think you know, Muhammad had somebody who is telling him a lot about the Torah and he was really intrigued and he, he loved it and he basically just kind of copied pretty much all their rules and you know as Judaism today doesn't really carry out all these atrocious rules if it did it would be yeah. it would be ISIS or worse honestly it would be ISIS or worse if you were going to carry out all Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all those rules in the Old Testament and you know what's what's different from ISIS you know you're killing gays and you're you know you're publicly stoning uh, adulterers and you know things like that, and you're killing witches, and you know it's it's going to be messy. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, it's a uh, it's it's a good thing that they've grown out of it. It's just a shame that we you know the Muslims haven't yet. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, uh, it seems to be uh, cyclical that you know there's always seems to be somebody who's you know reengaging a religion and 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 bringing out basically the worst of it. Um. And hopefully, I mean, the internet is really kind of the, the focal point for atheists because uh, it gives us a chance to really point out all these things for a, a very wide audience. And of all the videos I've done, and I've done actually quite a few, um, this is one where I'd like to get a million hits. Um, I think you, you've been very informative, and I would very much like to see more uh, Islamic you know, videos of, of people who are questioning the faith or have given up the faith who are bringing this information to light that people really just they don't they don't know about or they don't want to know about and it's the ones who don't want to know about it are the ones that really should be hearing about it
Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll, I'll second the, the, the wish that it gets a million hits, but I, I, I doubt it. I, I don't get my, my top, my top video so far is, uh, I think it's uh, eighty-seven thousand and counting, which isn't, which isn't bad. I think you know, for I, I've only been, I've only been a YouTuber for like six months or seven months or something like that, so, um, it's not too bad, I think. Um, but it's yeah, I mean, it's uh. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, obviously, if I get a million hits, you know, in, in this video, I'd, I'd ask people, please go and subscribe to my channel, because um, if, if I'm getting more hits and views on my channel, then, you know, hopefully I'll be uh, more encouraged to just dedicate and devote more time uh, to the videos I do. I'll, I'll probably get, you know, a bit more help in the, on the Patreon front as well, if, if more people know who I am, um, and then I'll be able to produce a lot more content. And there's a, there's a lot more content that I plan to produce regardless of whether I kind of increase my viewership or not. Um, you know, I just want the videos to be out there because, you know, you never know. <laughs> I've got so many ideas in my head that I think will be a benefit to other people. They, they, they will benefit, hopefully, Muslims who are, op you know, who are open-minded and uh, yeah. have the ability to question their own religion. Yeah. And uh, also, I think, non-Muslims who debate Muslims a lot, you know, I can, I can potentially give them some decent resources to... Yeah. You know, decent arguments to um, to invalidate Muslim arguments. Um, yeah, I've so. always said that I, I don't do my videos basically for anyone. I mean, I, I had you know something that I wanted to say, and I just wanted to put it out there. Mm. And uh, I, I think it's important that you know I think it's cathartic for people to to say what they're feeling to get it out there. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, put it out there. You don't need an audience because the audience will find you. Yeah, I think it's true. I mean, I think that that to me was slightly true as well in in the first video that I did, and the, the, one of the reasons why I set up the channel, yes, as I say, it's to help open-minded Muslims question it more. That's the primary objective. Uh, I think the secondary objective is um, to show uh, and give and give the sources uh, to all the arguments debunking Islam, in, in my opinion, and I think that that helps people who, in my opinion, are very you know, selflessly uh, giving away their time as atheists, knowing that this is the only life they have, but actually trying to make the world a better place by, you know, going out and trying to knock some sense and reason into other people, where they can kind of they can be selfish and they can kind of, you know, just enjoy their life and not give, you know, not not care that you know ISIS is is getting a foot foothold in the Middle East and is growing, and their ideology is being you know attractive to even people. Young Muslims growing up in the West, um, you know, they, they they'll be like, well, it doesn't affect me. I'd rather live my life because they're they're entitled to do that. They're, they're you know they don't have an afterlife. When they come and try to make the world a better place, they're doing it for purely selfless reasons. They're not doing it because of a reward. And you know, people like that deserve you know all the help that they can get in terms of you know the the material, the the source material, and the you know the the, the, the arguments that you know people like myself and the rationalizer and Iris Infidel that, that we put forward um, and I, I think a lot of them are building up on these arguments so for instance they're able to kind of see through the BS that they get from some Muslims um, you know when they try to kind of lie to you or try to change the way Islam is for instance when they try to say hey look you know Aisha wasn't nine and you kind of you can kind of prove that yeah well according to Islamic sources you had no real good reason to suggest that she wasn't nine you know because it's in the authentic hadith and you're trying to come with other lesser authentic hadiths and stick them together and by deduction claim that she wasn't well if you're going to do that then anybody's age is going to be different because there's so many contradictions in the hadiths um, that it's it's going to be crazy it's you're not going to get anything and you can discredit anything in that in that regard. And if you're going to say, well, the hadith is perfect, if it's sahih, the hadith, if, if this is basically an authentic hadith that says she's nine, and if you're going to if you're going to dismiss that, then where do you stop? Because all the other authentic hadiths, you have to start questioning now. It's like, well, how did they reach the conclusion that this was genuine? Maybe they made the same mistake in bringing this forward as an authentic hadith as they did with the age of Aisha. How am I going to trust this anymore? And that Sharia, basically, the whole system of life for Muslims, the whole way that they're supposed to live their life, the, the, the instructions on how to pray, the instructions on how to perform Hajj, the rate of Zakat, all these things don't actually appear in the Quran. They appear in the Hadith. 
And if you can't trust the hadith, then then I'm sorry, but the, Islam is kind of dead. Um, you know, if you can't trust the hadith, you can't. You know, the, there are these Quran-only Muslims now, and I'd love to see what they what they say, um, because you can't. You know, you can't say that you have to pray five times a day if you're a Quran-only Muslim. You have to say you pray three times a day because that's only that's the only one which is kind of very clear. Uh, right. You know that you you pray before sun sun rises, midday, and after the sun sets. I think those are the three times um, that are specifically mentioned as such in the Quran. But every Muslim today, pretty much, prays five times a day, well, or at least believes that prayers should be five times a day. Yeah. So it's stuff like that, and I think it's 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 big questions that need to be asked. And and in Islam, they're obviously discouraged in the Islamic world. You can't ask these questions very openly. And so, you know, you can hide behind the pseudonym of the last Arab and put videos online to, you know, to make people question themselves a bit more. Yeah. Um, or, or you can be, you know, you can be braver than I am and, and, and you know, reveal your face and, and do it at the risk of getting killed. But, <laughs> yeah. Well, so I say it's, it's the, the most important thing is, is just putting the information out there. You can't make an atheist. You can't convince somebody to be an atheist. All you can do is, is point out information. All you can do is educate them. And usually it's the education that makes them question, and that's what makes people an atheist. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, it's, uh, I think you can't force it onto people. And it's, it's not good when it's forced as well, because if somebody accepts something like the first day you tell them about atheism, if you, if you were to tell them about the, the illogical nature of their religion, and they immediately say, "All right, I, I, actually, hang on a second. You're making a lot of sense here. Um, you're right. I'm wrong." That's not yeah. really that. You know, you want them to kind of study it themselves. You want them to kind of think it through, because if they're very easily swayed, then who's to say that in three days' time, you know, when the Jehovah's Witness knocks on their door, they're not going to be easily persuaded. You know, <laughs> so it's good that we encourage kind of critical thinking. Um, so well, yeah, it's also good. Uh, have people like Stamp Collector and uh, Dark Matter that uh, uh, more so Stamp Collector to present it in a comical way that it, it's fun to watch and has yeah. a, a very valid and important message. But yeah, anyways, we yeah, need to wrap this yeah. up because I yeah. need to go to work. Yeah, you probably I, I need to pick my kids up from school, so uh, I need to go as well in 15 minutes. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much for sitting yeah. down and talking in this very nice long conversation and some, I think, very you know useful insights and, and valuable information that I, I very much look forward to sharing with everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I, uh, I enjoyed it as well. And, I, and I'm going to uh, post your channel, and uh, please send me. I'm going to try to go through and try to find them, but... Uh, if you send me a yeah. list of other channels that you've mentioned, I'd love to share those as well. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I will do. I will do, definitely. I'll send you them in uh, like an email or something. Yep. Well, good. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And I'll, I'll talk to you later. I'm All Tom, right. your friend the neighborhood atheist, and this is the secular channel. And uh, you can find the masked Arab by searching for him. And you can find me at Tom the Atheist on. And uh, please subscribe and subscribe to. Uh, the Mass Arab, and uh, thank you very much for watching. And that's the wrap. <laughs>